Jose, this is really a truly a fantastic meeting, so thank you for including me as well. I will go very quickly with my disclosure. I consult for those two companies and other patents are managed by University of Washington and Case Western Reserve University. And today I'm going to focus on something that we have been working for over three decades uh, and ultimately led to this presentation today. So uh, we'll see how, how that goes. If we consider a generic uh, uh, diseases that affect large number of population, we're facing completely different problem than for some very selective uh, monogenic diseases uh, with a small number of patients. Uh, in case of, for example, dry form of AMD, I just listed only three uh, little, little uh, problems that one has to consider. Namely, we really don't know where the initiation of the degeneration in AMD happens. Are those RPE uh, affected first, uh, the rod cells or cone cells? Each of us may have a preferable cell type uh, that believes it is the initiation of the disease. We, for example, believe are those uh, very active rods that are very close to, to macula, they are affected first, and that's where the disease spread from. There is also another aspect of this degeneration that even in monogenic, a very severe diseases, very often young animals or patients do not display severe phenotype until later on in life. So somehow cell is capable of dealing with that genetic stress or environmental stress before it is uh, decided that there is no hope and gave up. We don't have too many surrogate diseases uh, for AMD. And the two closest one, which uh, those two diseases display some sort of a phenotype that could be attributed or have seen in dry AMD is Stargard disease and let, let, uh, late onset uh, retinal macular degeneration. So some of those aspects of those two diseases, so we can learn from monogenic disease uh, before we move into a more common and <clears throat> more complex multifaceted disease like dry AMD. Finally, if we wanted to have uh, this uh, treatment effective, it, it has to be given prophylactically. So imagine that if only 25% of us will develop AMD, well, if we will have to take that uh, drug today, every day, that's a big challenge. Are we going to do that before the onset of the disease? And the, once the onset of disease happened, there may not be a pharmacological way of preserving the retina, but rather to go to those other extreme technology that we're working on. It has to be inexpensive to reach a large population. And again, it deals with the older patients, which again has to be convenient and in a simple way can be provided that will be used by those people. For example, a pill every day morning not every fourth day, because that will be a very confusing. So there are many, many challenges. And I wanted just to show you our approach today using systems pharmacology. <clears throat> there are two in pharmacology uh, way of approaching to disease or infection. One is uh, called polypharmacology. When let's say we have a, a bacteria or a virus that affect the tissue, we wanted to maybe intervene in different cell cycle of those, uh, those uh, uh, creatures to stop them to grow or divide, uh, to stop producing energy specifically. And that will be a polypharmacology. The system pharmacology is when we're having a multiple uh, initiating target, a different receptor that culminate in one product inside the cell. And so they can be used synergistically at very low dose. And that's what I'm going to show you today. So without going into an extremely deep introduction, how we came about this, uh, I will just only show you two major observations. Two major observations. So here uh, we have um, RPE, uh, ARPE19 cells that when challenged with all transretinal, even at very low concentration, about 10 micromolar, they produce calcium increase inside the cells as depicted by those black dots. This is where the calcium has been released from internal stores. It is very specific to aldehyde, not to alcohol or to other controls, and this is again release of calcium by ionophore. 
All transretinal is a product of visual cycle. It happens every single time as we absorb light and cause azomerization of 11 cis retinal. Retinal is released from rhodopsin. So it can be as high as the level of bleaching. It can reach five millimolar concentration. And here you have only a few micromolar. You can do this experiment virtually on any cell line and results will be very similar. The mechanism of toxicity of retinal is quite the same. Now, if we go uh, with the treatment of biretinal, over, over time, you can see the time course of increase of this calcium, and eventually all of those cells will die. The second observation is using a, a very light sensitive animal model that I will describe to you in a minute, but also albino rats and mice, when those animals are exposed to strong illumination, there are radicals, superoxide radicals are uh, formed, and this experiment's done on tissue uh, that is isolated from the animal uh, after challenge with light. So this is very rapidly sectioned and stained with the dye specific to superoxide and radicals. So we have on one hand the calcium, on another hand, again, light and release of aldehyde, those radicals, they are formed as a result of the light exposure. So this immediately could put us into a cascade of events because this has been detected or that, uh, described in the uh, cancer research uh, 20 years or so before that retinal, which was tried as a chemotherapy agent, um, allow to study the signal transduction. And we know that retinal causes increase in the activity of phospholipase C, increase in production of IP3, increase in uh, of opening the uh, internal store for calcium and release it. This again, in turn, affects of an ADPH oxidase and leads to cell death. If that's all correct, we should use a common generic pharmacological agent and stop the progression of disease. And indeed, you see these names over the, uh, the uh, different uh, steps of the pathway that you can preserve retina and prevent retina degeneration. So you can approach to multiple stages of that signal transduction and stop it. The most exciting is that you can trigger this activation or inactivation via G protein cap receptors. You have to block GQ by, for example, this set uh, of antagonists. You can activate GI, the inhibitory G protein, by those factors. And again, you can inhibit GS because there's also feedback mechanism that connect adenylase cyclase uh, with the rest of the signaling uh, that affect <clears throat> and ADPH oxidase. So this, again, allows us to uh, access that signal transduction from multiple point of view. And the most important is that they are regulated by G protein couple receptors. From about 1,200 all agents approved by FDA and unique agents, not different product, about half of them are against uh, the pathogens, they are, not, uh, they are foreign to, uh, to humans. And from remaining, about 70% GPCRs are the target of those approved drugs. The success of that comes from several reasons. One of them, that the receptors are in plasma membrane. So your drug do not need to penetrate the cell. It can just attach to the extracellular domain and activate the, the signal transduction. The second thing, that there are internal mechanisms of desynthetization. So if, in other words, overdose, it's not very often because the receptor will move from plasma membrane to internal components and it will be degraded. There is a lot of G proteins, 18 of those involved in signaling from around 800 GPCRs, uh, uh, genes present in our genome that affect virtually every physiological function, every physiological process. So we're lucky here. We can connect the GPCRs. We can connect well-defined pharmacology and affect downstream effectors in multiple ways. And so here is the idea that we can now use several GPCRs that by a common, a commonality in the signal transduction pathway will impinge on that one effector nut in the cell. It could be an ADPH oxidase, it could be adenylase cyclase, but in substechiometrical amount at very low dose of those drugs and affecting multiple 
receptors, we will be able to affect the outcome of those signal transductions. On the left side are all GPCRs present in our genome, and I color coded, and it's not really important to read all of these numbers, by number of transcriptome per million. And of course, you can see here rhodopsin is very highly expressed in the retina, but about 150 other GPCRs are expressed in the retina. And taking into account that 80% of all of these cells are photoreceptors, majority of those GPCRs are present in photoreceptors. And we can now uh, make a table of all of those GPCRs and start asking questions. Can we preserve by agonizing them or, uh, or activating them? Can we prevent retina degeneration if we have animal model? So this animal model that I'm going to describe to you uh, also is supported by many different technologies by very conventional histology, GICC, EM, by more modern imaging techniques, particularly in our case by two-photon microscopy, ERG, and analytical mass spectrometry. And then at the end of my talk, I will show you as something that is absolutely, for me, revolutionary, the way of looking at transcriptome and effect of drugs on the expression of different genes. And finally, about profiling and specificity of the different uh, drugs using in vitro system that provide more insight of those signaling pathways. So here is our animal model. It is double knockout of ABCA4, uh, which should mimic genetically Stargard disease. Phenotypically, those mice are normal until about 60 uh, 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 months of age. Uh, then we also took the second gene of the cascade and we have now two that process all transretinal that we can use in our experimentation. So double knockout now in large degree, it's very similar to Stargard disease. So when we take those mice and expose them to light, you can see how rapidly there are changes in the retina. And there are changes one af day after of light exposure, and eventually about seven days later, the retina clears. You can see the first synapses, how much they change when we expose them to, mice, to light. So 90% or so, all of uh, the photoreceptors are going to be gone. And the effect goes throughout the retina. So it's not only that we're substracting photoreceptors, we're affecting down to the ganglion cells, every single layer of the retina, as if this is a, a connected tissue that allows to uh, propagate the signal. This is the EM slide showing you the changes, vacuolization in the synapses, and eventually the synapses will completely collapse. So it's not like if we take photoreceptors or we damage photoreceptors that the other neurons in the retina do not, uh, are not affected or do not affect the progression of the disease. We have to look at the entirety of the entire system. Here, just to show you OCT and outer uh, the, uh, the junction between inner and outer segment that become very blurry very quickly after light exposure and then through their degeneration before the retina degenerates. And here are the evidence of uh, changes throughout the retina, the rod con synapses, you have synaptodagmin uh, staining, you can see a dramatic changes, bipolar cells stained by PKC, horizontal cells by calbindin, or the activation of Miller cells by GFAP expression. So entire retina is on fire. And you need to, whether this is in our system, again, what is very nice, it is a binary system. Retina is healthy or it dies. There is no need for anything else, just whether we can preserve in these very, very harsh conditions for, for the cells, whether we can stabilize them. So through all of the analysis of uh, thousands of mice and different GPCRs taking into account the expression, we come up with those three uh, 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 agonist and antagonist, agonist of dopamine receptor and the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, beta-alpha-1a, uh, 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 again, those dependence of protection of the retina if they are given prior to light illumination. Here we start playing with combination of two drugs and so on, and three drugs, again, a very effective in preservation of the retina. 
all of the animals tested with those three combinations of three drugs at sub-stechiometrical amounts in much lower dose that individually, in combination, they are synergistically protecting retina from degeneration. And so here we have, <clears throat> again, synaptotagnin staining, PKC, calbindin, everything now it looks like if those animals were not exposed to light, and ERG, of course, are normal and unaffected by the treatment of the drug. Here we have uh, two photon imaging, again, large number of cells. As we go from RPE, you can see the photoreceptors, how enlarged they are. They are about three times larger. They eventually will burst and uh, will pick up by, by uh, Marco Gria, like you can see here, that will clear this space from uh, membrane uh, material. On the other hand, after treatment with this drug, this is again the same genotype, you can see that the photoreceptor cells are not as active in this assay. They are quite quiescent after treatment with the sub combination of three drugs. We extended this to bulb C. All of those experiments were done. And again, you can see the staining of the retina, preservation by histology. Again, the two photon shows you the damage. And again, in uh, those bulb C mice, there is no damage if I treat them with uh, BMT or uh, BMD. Both are very uh, successfully protecting retina from degeneration. Finally, we look on the trans transcriptome, and this is work with uh, Anand Swarup. When we uh, did uh, uh, triplicates in every condition, we tested about eight mice to 10 mice per each condition, and we asked what are the changes in transcriptome. Transcriptome should be the most sensitive into changes in the retina. And here is the single uh, treatment. The light causes changes in about 600 genes, up and down regulation. Then individual treatments are preserving more and more and better those a transcriptome as if they were not exposed to light. The triple uh, treatment, it provides the best uh, uh, product. Again, the uh, SLO, it shows you here uh, uh, microphages infiltrating the retina, quiescence in the treatment, histology very nicely preserved, and the principal component analysis, when you go from control, it moves to the light condition right here, and you can bring it back by this combination of three GPCRs at those low doses. And again, if you look on the transcriptome, dramatic changes throughout, and yet the triple, it causes very nice preservation of the transcriptome in these three lines. And on the bottom, you can see that this particular triple combination causes a subset of about 40 genes that are not protected by the treatment with GPCR antagonist and agonist. So this could be either lack of protection of those particular genes or, or transcripts, or it could be that it is a side effect of the drug. And this, again, can be done quantitatively. Therefore, again, looking on large number of genes that are protected or not by the treatment of those drugs. Finally, I would like to finish with the profiling of uh, specificity. For that purpose, we use GPCRs, the cell line that express um, G protein uh, that has a venous uh, yellow protein coupled to uh, beta subunit of G protein. And when the G protein splits, the uh, beta gamma associate with receptor kinase and causes energy transfer. So starting with the uh, luciferase activation, so there's no light involved, just in situ production of the light and the transfer of energy transfer to venous and emission. And you can see here agonists for a particular GPCR, very nice time cause. And again, now we have all of those receptors present in the eye. We know which G protein is present in the eye. We know how to look at the couples and, and, and analyze the specificity with the drug which we have uh, used. So here, just to show you the activation uh, of a particular receptor with different uh, G protein. And in, in the scale of the potency, the amplitude, if you will, uh, we can just use those uh, six marks, uh, five marks. Uh, G0 will be preferable G protein for activation of that particular receptor. G13 will not be activated 
olfaction, G protein will not be activated. G14 will be only partially activated as well as G0. So this is kind of a representation of how specifically that particular G protein couples to this particular receptor. And there is more information, not only the amplitude, but also the dose dependence and time course of the activation. So here we have again tau as a, a half time of activation, uh, and we can also measure at five seconds and, five, and one second to look how quickly those drugs are acting and how quickly they are cleared. So again, uh, to our surprise, many of them so-called specific uh, antagonists and agonists are not that specific. And again, uh, the particular the dopamine, uh, do, uh, um, dopamine receptor uh, antagonists are also an activator of adrenergic system. So we have a lot of interplay between those signal transduction and trying to make sense out of it. We will be able to put together the combination that can be tested in humans. So in very quick summary, a high dose of monotherapy preserve retina in this animal model and also in albino mice. Uh, we can use them individually, but at uh, optimal dose, which will be relatively high dose, uh, still can, can, can be translated into the dose that is used in humans. And when we use in combination, we can use them at substechiometrical or sub optimal dose, but yet because of the synergy of the signal transduction, they have the largest impact on the uh, histology, on the function, but also to restore as all sets of genes that are misregulated because of the pathology. I believe that this approach will be quite applicable to many, many complex diseases that were required a chronic treatment for decades the Parkinson, schizophrenia, bipolar, glaucoma, all of those will be a, could be approached uh, using system pharmacology as I depicted to you today. We have spent a lot of time on uh, understanding of signaling, particularly for the transduction, starting with rhodopsin, and this is really paying off because very similar signal transductions are occurring not only as a part of signal transduction, and translating the light signal into a neuronal signal, but also the function of other GPCRs in the eye. We know quite well about chemistry of vision via retinoid cycle and via retinoid isomerase and LRAD and how to take advantage of those enzymes involved in the retinopathy. And finally, I would like to leave you with a, a very simple two sentences that complex diseases will require the complex approaches. There is very unlikely a one treatment. It only, as we heard before from glaucoma, only lowering intraocular pressure will do so much. And it's quite a lot compared to nothing, but it's not a cure. It will require a multiple approaches and multiple pathologies that are corrected by the treatment. So I believe that system pharmacology could pave the way to solve really medical needs of the very complex and uh, general diseases and it's also important that we're dealing now with very large heterogeneous population uh, that of different uh, genetic background and also exposed to different environmental factors, diet, place of leave, uh, life, and, and also uh, the um, other exposure to, to toxin throughout the life. So it's not going to be easy, but I think we made a right step, uh, and particularly the prophylactics, it will be the way before the retina degenerates. And, and that's another point I would like to leave with. And here are the people involved, uh, the most important are listed, and uh, I'm ready for any questions you have.